Welcome to Alchemergy. My name is Dennis William Hauk, and together we will explore the ancient mysteries of alchemy. The fire burns steadily in the Athenor, the cylindrical brick furnace at the center of the alchemist's laboratory. Midway up the Athenor, two glowing holes gaze out into the darkened room, while occasional puffs of falling ash drift from a wider opening below. On top sits a huge glass retort, its single opening stopped with clay, and inside the glass, a heavy mass of dark green mud folds about itself in slow, swirling currents. The writhing blob represented months of hard work pulverizing, roasting, dissolving, and breaking down materials thought to contain a mysterious essence known as the first matter. It could be found in nature in caves and crevices, locked in certain ores, or even deep within the human body. Some said it had an affinity for discarded or rejected materials, and many medieval alchemists believed it could be obtained from feces and urine. In 1669, German alchemist Henning Brandt announced he had discovered the first matter after distilling over 1,300 gallons or 5,000 liters, of urine. After months of accumulating urine, he boiled it down to a thick syrup, which he distilled into a red oil. After adding the oil back into the blackened material that remained, he heated the mixture intensely for 16 hours. Suddenly it began emitting an eerie green light. He poured it into cold water, where it solidified into a glowing white powder. Alchemists throughout Europe began experimenting with urine, convinced they had found the first matter and could use it to make the fabled philosopher's stone. However, what Brandt had actually discovered was phosphorus. Named from the Greek word for light-bearing, it fit the alchemist's expectations for the first matter perfectly. Wherever they could find it, this primordial chaotic substance was the goal of all alchemists. It was their belief that once they had isolated enough first matter, they could purify it and produce the Philosopher's Stone, which in turn could perfect anything. Of course, just how to accumulate and purify the first matter was the greatest mystery in alchemy. Back in the laboratory, we turn our attention away from the blazing furnace. Along the wall to the right, we see two shelves stretching the length of the room. The upper shelf holds the carcasses of assorted frogs, birds, snakes, rabbits, and rats, while less identifiable creatures peer out from preservative filth jars. Hanging from the ceiling is a preserved crocodile and some large dried fish. Alchemists believe the life force is like a subtle stuff that can be separated from living things and used to impart health to others or even give life to inanimate objects. Many famous alchemists claim to have created little beings called homunculi by infusing the life force into flasks of chemical compounds. Beneath the two long shelves is a narrow workbench piled with odd-looking utensils, tongs, ladles, pincers, and leather bellows. At the center of the bench, next to a small herb press, a balancing scale seesaws aimlessly, caught in a passing draft of air. Meanwhile, in the dark space underneath the table, an iron cauldron full of decomposing organic matter gurgles suspiciously. This disgusting tub is known as the digester, in which materials rot and break down in an operation called putrefaction. Against the opposite wall, two sturdy bookcases are stuffed with stained papers, manuscripts, and leather-bound books. Between the bookcases, an empty chair sits next to a broad wooden desk. On the cluttered desktop is a large notebook with a quill pen waiting patiently in its inkwell. The pages are covered in a frenzied hash of words and numbers, bizarre diagrams, airy creatures, and mythological figures intended to capture the alchemist's inner experiences during his experiments. On the back wall, a bewildering array of glass vessels are supported on wooden pegs. Odd-shaped flasks, 
speakers, cylinders, and retorts of all sizes are spread across the entire wall. Alchemists designed their vessels for both practical and esoteric uses, and they believe the shape of a vessel affects the concentration of the ethereal substances with which they work. The womb-shaped retort isolates living essences by heating. The vase of Hermes, or Ludl, is a pear-shaped glass open at both ends, used in sublimation. The pelican is a distilling vessel with two side arms that create a circulatory mixture of vapors. Other names for specific vessels were the philosopher's egg, skull cap or brain pan, angel tube, spirit holder, moon vessel, mother of the stone, matrix face, cup of Babylon, and the tomb of the dead. In the corner, an array of coiled copper tubing zigzags upward from a large gourd-shaped clay vessel on the floor. Known as a serpent condenser, the giant air-cooled apparatus is used for distilling the foul-smelling solution poured off from the digester. Distilling purifies even the foulest liquid and concentrates the strength of its essences. The process is used to produce alcoholic spirits, essential oils, herbal extracts, tonics, tinctures, and elixirs. Isolated in the opposite corner of the room, a large gray curtain hangs from the ceiling. Draped around a small altar, this tent or tabernacle forms a private meditation space called the oratorium. As much work is done in the oratorium as is carried out in the laboratory. Alchemists spend many hours in solitary contemplation, attempting to purify and focus their minds. Their motto is, Ora et Labor, Pray and Work. Hidden somewhere near the oratorium is the alchemist's incubator. This insulated, copper-clad wooden box, kept warm by the fermenting matter within, is where the alchemist directs his thoughts and visualizations. During fermentation, the first matter is most open to the influence of the alchemist, who tries to enter a symbiotic relationship with the matter at hand and suffer with it through its transformations. If anyone other than the alchemist touches or even looks at the incubator, all is lost. At this stage, the work is easily corrupted by impure thoughts. To alchemists, consciousness is a force of nature that can be purified and focused through meditation and then used like a fire to transform things. It is the one essential ingredient you will never find listed in the alchemist recipes.